David, it's can I may I just say that that this is a, a real honor for me to be able to talk to you in 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 this forum, um, and I'm very grateful to you for for doing it. It was my pleasure. Thank you for asking <laughs> me. And so, David, I have I have I have I'm I'm going to jump in with some since the Center for Fiction is a celebration of fiction, but also the the um, interrogates the creation of fiction. I'm going to ask you some shop talk questions, hey. if you don't mind. No, not at all. One of the things that, that I'm that i um, personally would be terrified to do and have never tried to do, but I'm convinced that I would not be able to do, is to write dialogue. And the, you know, the first thing that one notices about Shelter in Place is the, the, the um, very... I mean, we're talking about drama earlier before before we went live. Um, the, uh, the extremely dramatic set pieces of long, long dialogues with many characters interacting in, in long dialogue form, which you do so deftly and so in such a sustained, um, you know, ebullience and, and high level. Um, I'm just basically marveling at, at the at it and also wondering. How do you do it? How do you how do you write dialogue? How do how do you go about it? Well, um, first of all, uh, I'm glad that that you appreciated the dialogue. This is the most dialogue heavy or dialogue driven novel I've ever written. Um, when I teach uh, my workshops, and and I'm happy to see a number of of my former students here, uh, or see their names. <clears throat> One of the things I usually ask the students is, is how many of you consider dialogue easy? And usually about half of the students raise their hands. And how many of you consider description, writing description easy? And usually exactly the other half of the room, all the ones who, who did not raise their hands for dialogue, raise their hands for description. So I'm, um, uh, I'm one of the people for whom dialogue comes pretty naturally. It's not an ordeal for me. On the other hand, if you asked me to describe a face, it would be, I could do it, but it would not be, it, it would not be, it would be exhausting. It would be a real effort. And, and so at a certain point, as, as I was working on this novel, um, and, and it was sort of, if it, to borrow a, a tech, a technology term that I rather like it, the dialogue was starting to self-populate in the novel, mm. uh, it was sort of of its own accord. I also was was reading a lot of writers whose work is primarily dialogue, and and I became mm. kind of interested in, in that. And 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 I I ended up turning to the the probably the two most extreme examples that I know of, who are Ivy Compton Burnett and Henry mm. Green, uh, mm. whose novels are are virtually all dialogue, and I was fascinated by the way that they not only they not only both write such great dialogue but they move the story forward through dialogue so that was yeah. what i decided i wanted to do it seemed to me especially appropriate for a novel about politics because what better way to get mm. to not fall into the trap of of sort of um becoming idea of, of being over overly ideological than to have people arguing mm. yeah Everyone. Yeah, but I, I, I just, I just find it. I'm kind of awestruck. I find it um, incredible that you were able to keep all these voices in, uh, intact, distinct one from another, and interactive in the way that they really did feel like people in the room. So, I mean, regardless of what your uh, school chum might have said, I think you're well equipped to write a play should you choose to do that. But do you? hear the voices in your head? Do you pace around the room speaking in all these different voices? How, 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 technically, how do you go from one voice to another and how to keep it all, how to keep all the balls in the, float in the air? Um, I, I definitely hear them in my head. Um, occasionally I'll speak lines aloud, but that's usually in order to get the word order correct, to, to, to mm -hmm. make it sound like dialogue. Um, but I actually rewrite rewrote the dialogue over and over and over again. It was not, uh, there weren't, there were a few scenes in the book that that just, I just wrote them and, and they're in the book in their final form. But in most cases there, were, there was as much revision as with any other kind of writing. Mm. And, and do you, do you, do you feel, feel like, like, like uh, 
the uh, you just set like like you're a director. You set the scene. You, you knew the characters, these characters in the room, and mm -hmm. you know that in this scene they have to bring up the 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 question of Ava's whatever, and then you just let them talk, or do you do you know going in? How much do you know going in? You set mm -hmm. you start to set set up a scene. Mm -hmm. Well, I think you know there's a line I, I often quote from from Theodore Ruthke. You, uh, we learn by going where we have to go. Um, another version of that is the 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 old lady quoted both by Ian e. Forster and Flannery O'Connor, who says, "How can I know what I mean until I see what I say?" So usually, what happens what would happen with those scenes is I would I would have a kind of basic germ of an idea. I mean, for example, there's a a scene in the middle of the novel in which in which four of the principal women are at a country house in Litchville County, Connecticut, and they're kind of off a little distance from the house sharing a joint. Um, and that my initial idea was that I wanted to write a, a scene, a, a stoned scene, essentially, how people talk yeah. when they're getting stoned. Um, yeah. at, at that point though, I realized that, that there were things I needed to do to move the story forward and that this scene gave me an opportunity to do. So I started adding details that that really hadn't come to my mind originally, but were were necessary in order to figure out where the story was going. Um, right. And so the sort of the figuring out another analogy, which I will credit to my friend and colleague Jill Cement, who you also know, David. Uh, mm -hmm. She said it's it's like it's like building a bridge and crossing it at the same time. Yeah. Yeah, but how do you know when you have enough characters? Because this this book has a lot of characters. A lot of characters. And, I mean, I, I wondered how, how you how you plotted not plotted it out not in terms of plot per se, but how you plotted it out in terms of uh, number of characters and yeah. numbers of complementary characters and numbers of couples versus single people. And, I mean, how did you arrive at that perfect perfect population? How did you populate the book? I guess I'm asking. <laughs> Uh, well, this book had a long gestation. Um, the earliest draft of it was written uh, in 2009. And at that point, it was not taking place after the Trump election, which obviously hadn't happened. It was taking place, believe it or not, after the election of Ronald Reagan in 1980. But it was the same premise, a, a, a woman uh, who considers herself to be a, you know, a diehard Democrat is so appalled by Reagan's victory that she decides to buy an apartment in, in another country. Um, yeah. And uh, as I kind of followed that line, um, she, I had certain ideas about her. I knew she had a husband. I wanted to give her a best friend. Um, mm. And- it Has to be a best friend. A best friend, men. Yeah. Um, and then I, I realized that 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 she was a woman who had a, a circle of friends, that a sort of portable circle of friends that she took with her, uh, uh, who were mostly because she's rather wealthy, who were mostly somewhat uh, a little bit subservient to her, willing right. to argue with her, but never too much, uh, right. and. Um, and and you know I lived, I lived a lot of my life in New York, and I had met yeah. enough people in New York that I was able to kind of draw on experiences I'd had, people I'd met, in order to create this sort right. that felt right. real to me. Right. Did you did you consciously make one couple have all the money and all the other couples have less? Yes. <laughs> okay. Because it, it was I mean, it's a very specific dynamic where. One, well, one couple, of, you know, has the country house and has the dinner parties. And, yeah, and, and 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 I think that that is kind of a key to Eva, who is who is the principal character in the book, and whom a lot of reviewers who have who have liked the book have seemed to all agree that they don't especially like Eva; that she's a very unlikable character. I personally have a great fondness for her, but mm -hmm. um, she's she's a woman who whose sense of, of personal uh, worth is dependent on having a, a kind of a, a, a salon, a group of people 
who she yeah. can count on to kind of both keep her from being bored and uh, stimulate her imagination, but not take her anyplace uncomfortable. Right. But it's so, but you, you make you you take pains at the beginning to point out that she didn't like creative people in the in her yeah. circle. It's all sub, uh, so secondary or tertiary people at one or more removes from the creative whatever we call that. Yeah, which I thought was an interesting decision because most of the salonistas or salonists are um, they aspire to the reverse. They want to be you know where the where they where the action is right and this is this is a salon that was deliberately a couple of steps removed from the action which i thought was a very interesting decision yeah i i think that that reason i uh, i mean i i would say that for for the character for eva um it's very important that she be the the pole star that everything re orbit around her which is why an actual create a, a creative person would be a threat because a creative person would 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 possibly displace her um eva is herself someone who has had aspirations to to write to um uh, she's been working on a book that one imagines she'll probably never finish about uh right. uh about set in, set in Venice that 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 could be a novel could be a biography about Isabella Stewart, Stewart Gardner she's not ready to give up that centrality and so she wants people around her who will affirm it but but really she's 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 someone who's who's deeply uh um uh vulnerable and afraid mm -hmm. and so a lot of this is sort of shoring up a sense of security that Trump's election kind of explodes Yes, yeah. as, as it. No, she comes off as, 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 as fearful. As, as as for, yeah. Sorry, she comes off as fearful. You know, yeah, very protected, very very defended, and very protected. Yeah, yeah, and, and fra fragile. I mean, all the all those qualities that what rich people tend to have. But, so, um, so David, let's talk about decorating. It's a it's a it's a book about decorators, which is yeah. it's an interesting milieu. Did you do you have do you have a um, um, unfulfilled aspirations in that department no i have i have, I have no i have no talent uh in that department but i have a, a fascination with it the uh the only magazines that i subscribe to are um uh the world of interiors in british house and garden uh i love yeah. i love yeah. interior uh decoration I'm, it it, yeah. it it interests me but but it's a one reason and 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 the the decorator character was was actually much more central in, in earlier drafts of the mm. book. At a certain point, he was the narrator. Is mm. that is it an art or is it a trade? This is a question that that comes up uh, frequently. Um, the uh, you know is decorating an art or is it, it? I think it is an art, but it's an art that can only be practiced if you have wealthy clients, because yeah. uh, or yeah. you know so. You know that that was a, a a question that I wanted to explore. It's also the art of creating homes for other people, which is a kind of, uh, if you think about it, a kind of um, weird idea. I mean, home is the 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 idea, and I'm some say this is someone who has never had a decorator in my. I mean, I I have a friend who's a decorator who who has handled all my curtains. But I've always picked out the fabric for better or worse, possibly for worse. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, the idea that that home, which is which is a place that of safety and, and everyone has a very private personal idea of safety, yes. could be created by someone else for you was was really interesting to me. And yeah. so I wanted to uh, the, the decorators seem like a really good way into this question of what home means. Mm. Uh, and you know what uh what there's the epi, one of the epigraphs to the book is from auden's september uh september 1st 1939 where he talks about the, the furniture of home um uh yeah. as a kind of protection mm -hmm. so yeah that was probably the aspect that was interested me the most yeah i was very interested in the, in the character of pablo is that 
not a major not mm -hmm. a character, but mm -hmm. when he when he's on stage, so to speak, he's, I find him very compelling. Mm -hmm. He's the he's the oldest character in the in the story, and has seen it all and heard it all. And, uh, you know, going. But I thought that he he lent an interesting perspective to the whole. He was one of my favorite characters too. Um, and uh, uh, when I created him, <laughs> because he really has no basis in anyone I know. Uh, the only thing I, w I was sure of was that I wanted him to be Argentine, Argentinian, mm -hmm. and to have survived, you know, a, a terrible period in Argentina. Right. Uh, the other thing that I went back and forth on was, you know, there's this sort of received idea that isn't actually true that male decorators are, are by and large gay. I think there's an assumption that when you meet someone who's a, who's a decorator or an interior designer who's a man, that that person will more than likely be gay. And so I, in earlier drafts, pa Pablo was gay and he and, mm -hmm. and uh, Jake had actually had an affair at a, at a certain point. But then I decided it would be a lot more interesting to make pa Pablo straight and to make him a, a straight man who uses the assumption that he's gay as a way to have affairs with his female clients without their husbands being suspicious. And that provided me with an opportunity for a certain amount of comedy, but it also was, was a chance to sort of pull the rug out from underneath all sorts of assumptions that people right. carry around about, about sexual identity and certain professions yeah no it was interesting uh, choice decision and um and then what, what about the uh i mean this thing of of uh, eva's of always having uh these gay cooks yeah around her as 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 courtiers who um who are both part of the circle and not quite part of the circle because they're actually employees yeah i mean um that was well, I mean, to some extent, that was based on on things that I witnessed uh, when I when I lived in New York. Um, the a, a certain kind of, I mean, reality. I, I also, I just happened to be rereading uh, Muriel Sparks' novel Symposium, in which there is a character exactly like that, uh, a, a young gay student who makes extra money cooking for rich people. So I think. It may just be a, a kind of urban phenomenon, but again, I wanted to to sort of do something interesting with it uh, by. And also, what what it says about Eva, what it says about her, so quote unquote tolerance or lack thereof, and you know, being being uh, uh, you know, sort of with it, but not not too with it. You know, she the, she's so squeamish about sex. She's squeamish about of, sex, but she she likes to have gay men around her yeah. because she's got a certain kind of um, uh, charisma that she's got a bit of a diva quality that, mm. uh, that attracts younger men, but mm. woe to use a very British term, woe betide them if they try to mm. get too close to her. Mm. Uh, she wants to keep people at a safe distance. And mm -hmm. early in the novel, the character of Matt, who is her, her sort of chef and f kind of friend, but she also pays him, makes mm -hmm. the mistake of asking her advice about a a, a very um, a, about his own life, and that's it. It's it's uh, it's finished because he's yeah, he's, he's come too close. Yeah. He's trespassed yeah. exactly. Yeah. Yeah, no, there was a very painful scene. The, the the most painful scene in the book, and there are many, but for me the most painful scene is when Min is gorging on the on the cookies in the kitchen, and, and the he keeps saying, "I'll oh, have another." Oh, right. Oh, I, 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 I can't. No, no, you must have another. And then she takes another, and then then Eva like lets her have it. You've, you've had seven cookies, or however much she said. Yeah. Like, <laughs> she she's obviously counting every cookie. Don't you hilarious. think you've had enough? These like these little tortures that people figure out how to how to inflict on each other. That was that, was, that scene was so well done. I mean, all all of them were delicious. The character Nin's a bit sad. No, she's yeah. running in place as fast as she can and not getting any younger and all that kind of stuff. 
Was that was that uh, was that hard to write? I have a you know, I did a couple of of, of men really evolved from well. You know, force is distinction between flat characters and round characters, and flat characters are are characters who just basically have one it can be summed up in one sentence. I mean, they're like cartoon characters. You know, Elmer mm -hmm. Fudd kill the rabbit, whereas round characters are obviously more complex. And yes. and he makes the point that there's there's a space there's a place in fiction for flat characters, and there are a number of, of minor characters who are rather flat in this book. Min began as a much flatter character than she turned out to be. She began as just kind of a, kind of um, uh, oh, you know, uh, well, the word is the word is 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 on the tip of my tongue, um, someone who who uh, a toady, a toady to Eva, yeah. who yeah. Uh, you know tells Eva what she wants to hear, so that Eva will take her on trips that she can't afford herself. Yes. But as I as she evolved in my mind, she began to have a much uh, wider, a, a much larger personality and um, to become increasingly a kind of a, a, a tragic figure, someone who who had, you know, a lot of potential and it, it just got sort of chewed up by the industry that she elects to work in, which is the magazine industry, which by the time the novel is taking place is really on its in its death throes in the United States. Uh, but, but I, I decided that she would be Southern and, and, um, my, uh, my, my parents-in-law are watching this. So they will appreciate my sharing this detail that Quincy, Florida, which is where Min is from is where they live. And the peanut field where Min and her sister search for relics of the old house that burned down is actually outside their house. So oh, nice. Jim and Diane, you have, your 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 peanut field, which I don't think is a peanut field any longer, has been memorialized in this book. Um, David, what about the, uh, the 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 number of contemporary references in the book? That mm -hmm. was, was so interesting to to have the group go here, Lydia Davis. Yeah, <laughs> um, and then also the. Uh, I, I loved how you, you vented about Barbara Kingsolver and, and, <laughs> and you gave, you know, it's best be wonderful, wonderful sense of freedom to give those opinions to one of your characters and let them, let, let the characters spout off. Well, I gave, I, I created this character of Aaron, uh, who is, is based on a lot of people that I know, who someone yeah, who he's, sort of, he's, he's very familiar. Yeah. He tells it like he's it is, you know, and he, and he's, he's perfectly willing to, to say, to say snarky yeah. things about, famous people. Um, well, that was great fun for me uh, to sort of put those ideas in his mouth. The, the Lydia Davis reading was really based, David, and you and I were both there at the reading that Rachel Cuss gave at Greenlight Books, uh, yeah. I believe in 2018, maybe 2017, um, Something like that. when there was that enormous, enormous mob of yeah. young people coming to hear her. And I was that was a very memorable night for me because it, 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 it was, it was to see such a, 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 a huge group of, of, of hungry young writers, just avid to, to listen to this writer. Uh, I briefly considered putting Rachel into the book, but then I decided mm. not to do that because I know her too well. And, mm. and Lydia Davis just seemed like the right choice. Uh, and it was great. It was a brilliant choice. And, but you but you rented the scene beautifully with all the, the conversations in the stacks in the back and all, all of those and, and I wanted to, people say. to do it mostly from the point of view of the least literary character in the book is Bruce yeah. his husband yeah. for whom this is a completely alien world and so right. he, I think he says about Lydia Davis's stories that they they sound like the sort of things you overhear people saying into their phones on the subway um and that was a, a because this book is in third person and and the point of view changes all the time, I, I tried deliberately to, uh, if if I was, like I, the literary world I know inside out. I could have written that scene very much as from an insider's perspective, but I wanted to write it from an outsider's perspective because I thought that that would be, you know, funnier and more interesting and in in a certain way truer, truer. Yeah, no, it's it's it, Bruce's point of view is the only one that would really 
be of interest to us in that situation because yeah. he has to figure out why we're paying attention to this and why why this is you know worth of our attention um was the uh character of bruce hard to write he seems he's so he's so res he's a responder until the very end when he then becomes a more of an in yeah. initiator he, he bruce was um again another character who who really uh evolved as 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 i worked on the book um initially bruce was just the mr you know mr moneybags i mean he's yeah. the, the husband who provides the money though and then eva's the the wife who who spends it um his contribution is the money that he earns her contribution is the life that she creates with that money which he is very very happy to participate in um he he's a man who who has a sort of a business life during the day but his whole every other facet of his life his wife organizes she even buys his clothes right. um what what happens in the book is that is that uh a series sequence of events leads bruce really for the first time in his life to uh start looking at his wife critically and mm -hmm to uh, hesitate or, or resist going along with what she wants, since what she wants is to buy an apartment in Venice, uh, rather on the spur of the moment in order to have a place to escape to in the event that, you know, as she puts it, the country goes fascist. And then, so, so I didn't anticipate that Bruce was gonna become as important a character as he was, or that he was going to go on the journey that he does. That all really, happened that was again another example of you know learn by going where you have to go yeah yeah uh, and um also just you're charting all of their separate courses and separate separate and and communal courses mm -hmm. was, uh, it was it was just really interesting to see you do that and imagine the kind of conducting like a conductor with an orchestra how you keep all these things going um then the character we haven't talked about was in a way was the is the the contrast to all of these other folk is the character of Kathy. Yes. Who is who is a completely different socioeconomic yeah. um segment of, of the population. And she's her life looks very different from the lives of the other characters. Yeah. And uh I thought that was an interesting decision to bring her into it in such a dramatic way. I mean her uh um situation is 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 by far the most dire of any of the characters in the book yeah and uh it was it was important to me to have that sort of uh contrasting story the story of kathy and her family um and of kathy's husband leaving her and of her cancer diagnosis everything that goes on with her yeah uh and the daughter, the crazy daughter. The, the crazy daughter. Uh, yeah. um, it was, I felt like it was, the, the idea that, that this woman would have, she's worked for Bruce for, for, for years, but he's never really seen her as a human being until mm. certain, you know, shifts occur in, the, in his cosmos that allow him to, or that yeah. compel him to. Um, the other character who, who was initially kind of a minor character became more interesting and who is meant as a contrast is, is, is Bruce's friend, Alec, or his next door neighbor, who is the yeah. Trump guy, right. the Trump supporter. And, and, and that was one of the most interesting and sort of, mm. for me personally, challenging parts of the book was, mm. was writing from the point of view of someone who had voted for Trump. Now, yeah. granted, he's a very different sort of Trump voter than the the typical Trump voter we're, we're shown. He's a you know wealthy, fairly sophisticated guy who basically wants to get the the corporate tax rate lowered. But I think right. a lot of people did vote for Trump for that reason um, more than we're probably willing to admit. Or they voted for him because he was the Republican candidate. Uh, someone asked me recently if I thought that Alec, who Alec would have voted for in this election, I think he would have probably shifted over to Biden. But that was, mm. 
I didn't want to make him a cartoon and I didn't want to make him a villain. I wanted yeah. to make him. Yeah, I, I thought, I, I thought there, that Bruce's walk walks with him were, were really interesting, really were very well done. And then and it served also to make Eva even more shrill that she couldn't even fathom taking a walk around the block with this guy was something that yeah. she, you know, was beyond the pale for her. I have to say about Eva and about Trump, and, and this is maybe verging a little bit into politics and the moment we're in right now. Mm -hmm. Eva is shrill. She's annoying. She's self-centered. She's, she's, um, she's, she can be quite careless with other people, but she sees the truth when no one else is willing to. She, mm -hmm. she looks at, she knows, uh, she feels the election as, as a personal affront. Mm -hmm. and, and part of the reason for that is because she is herself the child of, of, of emigres, mm -hmm. uh, Polish Jewish emigres. So, mm -hmm. you know, in the back of her mind is always this idea of, of potential displacement. Um, and this is mm -hmm. a, a theme or an idea that I've been preoccupied mm -hmm. with for a long time. My, my last novel, The Two Hotel Frankfurts, was also about displacement. It was about people fleeing Europe for America. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, at the beginning, the, the other characters tend to be a little bit um, dismissive of Eva's, they, they see Eva as somewhat, um, she's overreacting right. by saying that she needs a, a place to live in another country so she can escape. Uh, mm -hmm. but, but looking at it, from the point of view of, of, of 2020, I think Eva kind of saw how bad things were going to get. She, she was willing to, to, to confront that in a way that her, um, her friends were not, you know, uh, they're more, I mean, they're, they're all appalled and upset, but, but they don't, they don't, they haven't, they resist, the sense of crisis that that mm -hmm. Eva kind of uh, embraces, or if she doesn't if embraces, at least yeah. that drives her. Right. So, so I think that you know, time will prove her right in certain ways. Mm. You know, I don't know. I, I was saying before the election that if Trump won again, I would leave the country. A lot of people were. There was actually a an article in the New York Times by uh, Jennifer uh, Finney Boylan about uh, how uh, how she and her 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 spouse were going through the list of where they might move to. Yeah. A lot of people were having those conversations. In that way, Eva was just ahead of ahead of the the curve. Mm. Yeah, it's interesting, but she doesn't. She's not really political. I mean, she doesn't. The conversation is never really about no. the constitutional crisis per se. It's more that her sensibility is offended, yeah. and which I, which I, which is you know also kind of what I feel. I mean, in addition to everything else, and that when you talk to people who were maybe they weren't Trump voters two weeks ago, but they're not horrified by the phenomena the way we might be. Um, and you, when you're talk, talking to them, it, it really comes down to well, their sensibility is not offended. They're, they might be offended by specific policies, gestures, you know, legalities, whatever. But the, the overall sensibility is is not beyond the pale. Mm -hmm. I, Whereas for Eva, it's it's actually just the you just can't you, you can't believe that someone who looks like that and talks like that and has this, that sensibility could be the leader of, of, a, of a giant country. But that's something that you know, we've all had to get used to over the years of being, um, you know, being a, the, uh, you know, living in this country. So, you know, other countries don't have, don't have people who rise to the high, you know, the highest office who have that kind of sensibility. Well, I guess they do in, you know, Italy or. Yeah, Italy had Berlusconi. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But the, that, you know, I had a, a, a lot of it was cut, but there, there's a, there's a point in the, in the novel in which um, there's some conversation about, uh, uh, I think it's Pablo who, who, who um, had 
hopes that he that if Hillary Clinton won, he would be able to redecorate the White House, which is um, which is really the um, the the great crown and glory for decorators to be able to say I did a room in the White House. And, you know, the Obamas redecorated the White House with my they hired Michael H. Smith, who did a, you know, a a splendid job. Um, So if you look at it in terms of decor, uh, the I don't know, I never read anything about whether Trump redecorated the White House. I, I shudder to think what it would have looked like. But there is a reference to the fact that Nixon had a bowling alley installed in the White House that mm. was decorated by the the very great and and famous um, David Hicks, uh, and I think there's a joke about it, one of the, I think Aaron makes a joke, but what what's Trump Trump going to have installed uh, a stripper pole? Uh, right. Right. So so it's aesthetic as much as it's sensibility. Aesthetics are part of sensibility. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Um, David, can I ask you a question? Yes. Yeah. Okay. I, I'm. So, I want. I'm interested to know at what point in your career you started writing as well as painting. I know that you know, you, you you have a long history involved with performance, but but you you've been writing these fantastic. Uh, essays for the New York Review of Books, and I know you're working on a, well, I guess a, an autobiography. Uh, well, yeah, sort of a memoir. A sort of a memoir, which which mm. I am certainly looking forward to. But what I, I, I think of you as as much really as well, of course, I think of you principally as a painter, but I also think of you as a writer. When did you start writing? Uh, and it, it, it was relatively recent. I I thought about it for a long time. But I probably only started doing it in earnest less than ten years ago. Mm. I can't remember exactly when, but it, it it happened sort of all all at once after years of wondering if I could do it and thinking that I probably should try. Then one day I just had, sat down and started doing it, and then it, it it got more and more. It felt more and more um, a place where I could be at home in, in, in mm. writing. And now it's now it's it is truly a refuge because painting is so, for me anyway, so difficult, and sometimes so um, inconclusive. Do you that find that it gets harder with time? It gets it gets harder and easier. I mean, there's the whole shape of a career when you're young, and I'm sure you remember this. When you're young, you just do it because you, you what you do feels like it couldn't have been any other way. There's only, it's so clear what needs to be done and then you just do it. Then there's a whole middle part where it could be this way, it could be that way, it could be bigger, it could be smaller. There there are so many Mm -hmm. choices and so many, you know so much more. In a way, it just makes it cloudier and um, more um, uh, circuitous path. And then hopefully, maybe fleetingly, but it, it, you know, some some point later on, it becomes a more distilled again. So I, but I feel like it's always, for me, challenging. And interestingly, writing is a place where it's actually more clear because I'm I'm not writing fiction. I'm not trying to write dialogue or create characters. I'm just responding to things that mm. I can see, and you know, having thought about them for a long time, I. I fairly good idea of what I want to say. And I'm actually finding it a great source of, maybe I shouldn't even admit this, it's something that almost sounds boastful, I'm finding a great source of pleasure and fulfillment to, to actually find the right way to describe something or the right mm-hmm. phrase to bring something into focus because it's, I mean, you were talking about works of art, it's, it's, it's already an abstraction, it's already one step removed using language to talk about something that's, that's visual. So we, for me, it's interesting to try to create these the linguistic bridges to the art experience and illuminate it almost like way, it's, it's my version of, of writing a character mm. because I'm, I'm, I'm projecting on the artworks qualities that one might think of as human qualities or qualities of the character. But 
cup. It's interesting what you said. I, I feel the same way about writing that it gets, that as I get older, um, I, I would use the analogy of I'm like an old PC. I have more and more memory and that slows me down. Um, but I, I feel like when I was younger, I, and I, I see this in my students, I could write with a certain, with greater freedom and ease. Uh, mm. And and lately I've been thinking that the way, the solution to that is to try to yeah. write as if I weren't myself, to try to kind of- Oh yeah, interesting, yeah. You know, I, I understand why, why writers sometimes will suddenly elect to write books under pseudonyms. It's a way of, of, of jettisoning the burden yeah. of the reputation yeah. That, yeah. and jettisoning all that self-consciousness that has, a, has accrued over right. there. Yeah, no, I, I, I painted a, a whole, not a lot, but I, I have at times painted some parallel works of, you know, paintings that no one would, would necessarily know are mine. And I've never shown them and probably won't, but I like the idea that I could do something completely different than what I've you know, been known for so far. But it it's complicated because you know so much of the communicative function of pictures is is their recognizability. Mm -hmm. So if and if they're all of a sudden not recognizable as yours, then what are they? And, and it, it raises the whole issue of the identity of the maker tied up so much with the with the the meaning and the texture of the thing in a kind of uncomfortable way, but I don't know how to get around it. I think you just have to sort of, I mean, so much of, of writing is about self, uh, and I think this is probably true for, for all the arts. Um, it, it's, it's so much about uh, uh, self delusion. I mean, you have to kind of, mm. like when you're writing a novel and you have to pretend that you're going to, I at least find that I have to pretend that I'm going to be able to finish it much more quickly than I am. Mm -hmm. I'll say to myself or I'll say to Mark, my 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 husband, you know, I'm going to have it done in two months. Well, that he's sure. learned that that means I'm going to have it done in two years. But sure, the, sure. The, the lies you tell yourself to the. Yeah, no, that's the, 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 the common. That's the, probably the most common trick. This, you know, I'll have it done in six months. Right. Tops, and three years later, we're still talking about it. Yeah. And then I think also with with, you know, pretending to be someone other than yourself, it's it's something you do as part of the process, not, mm. you know, and then in the end you, you, you own up to it to yourself. Mm -hmm. um, but, but uh, there's a, you know, I've often thought that the, for me, the, the, every time I finish a novel, I immediately think whatever I write next, it's not going to be another novel. Uh, and then invariably it turns into another novel. Uh, so, you know, much of the last several years I spent on a couple of nonfiction projects that, that never, uh, took off. Um, mm -hmm. uh, I just am ceaselessly drawn back to this form that, you know, it constantly kind of eludes me in an interesting way. Uh, even and yet it, it does it, it gets harder it gets harder and harder and yet i couldn't imagine quitting i mean when i read that philip roth had decided to quit mm -hmm. writing i couldn't mm -hmm. even imagine like have you ever thought of, of just quitting painting with that oh, ever? Sure. but I mean, I, I mean i haven't i haven't done yeah. it but i certainly can, i can i think i can imagine reaching a point where it just doesn't seem necessary any longer but uh, i mean hopefully it's not for a while yeah, I haven't reached that point yet. Life would be easier in some ways yeah. without yeah, this, be, this burden. It would be, of, it would of, be, uh, be different. You know? yeah, 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 yeah. Um, and you and you're you're you. I know that you read an enormous amount. Um, well, I don't know about that. I, mean, I read on and off, but I you know I, yeah. I, I try. Well, you, I mean. You seem to me to have read a lot, but uh, what are there? Who are the? I mean, th this is because I, I I value your your taste, but are there any novels or works of fiction that you've read recently that you've been particularly 
excited by or impressed by? Well, I, I, I was very impressed with uh, Garth Greenwell. Is that his name? He just um, the, he just gave me a really nice shout out on. Uh, I didn't on, read the first one. I read the second one, which I, I was yeah. very very impressed. Yeah. With. Um, and what else is? What are the works of fiction? Um, I, I was. Um, um, I really like the friend, which is not not. The oh, it's a great one. Yes. Yeah, secrets. I mean, I like the, the new one also, but I, I, I really love the friend in particular. Um, I've been reading. I've been reading so many periodicals. I guess this is this is my way of coping with the election. They're just the the, the torrent of political writing, and you know, in all the magazines that we read, it's a, it's been you know, you know kind of overwhelming diet of that stuff. Uh, I want to take this opportunity, by the way, to say that 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 I'm at the moment feeling very grateful to Garth Greenwald because he said some very nice things about my book on Twitter and Instagram. And Great. since I am completely off of, I've never been on any social media. Uh, mm -hmm. I was I was amazed to see how many followers he had, and I even had a moment where I thought, gee, maybe I should start a Twitter feed, but then I mm. backed away from it because as it is, I spent half my life online. And if I, I fear that if yeah. I went down the social media rabbit hole, I would never get off the computer. Yeah. But yeah, that no, was, I think for some people, it's just, it, it's second nature and they do it very easily. And, and you know, it's part of the daily routine. I don't do it either. Obviously. Yeah. It, the one exception being that, that when during the during the actual days of the election i through a friend found the people on twitter who had all the inside information on the vote counts in different cities and that was the one moment i nearly joined twitter but i yeah i, I resisted um I, we do have a question from the audience so yeah. I'm pop up and read that mm -hmm. for you uh, how this is for you, David Levitt. How do you balance male and female sensibility when you write? Hmm. It's a very interesting question. Um, you know, so we're we li we're living in a kind of post-binary world, and uh, hmm. this is, I think, something that 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 is very uh, for 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 the generation of say the people, the students that I teach, this is uh, nothing new, but it is something mm. new for my generation, which, 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 mm. you know, we tended to be much more preoccupied with sexuality than with, than with gender. Um, mm. I find that, uh, well, with the proviso that, that, I'm, I'm going to talk about this in a somewhat binary way, and I just want to add the proviso that I, this is not in any way to to ignore the the various other hmm. ways that people identify themselves in terms of gender. But uh, I always think it's a really useful thing for any writer to do a kind of uh, cross gender narration to write hmm. for a, a man to write from the point of view of a woman. For a woman to write from the point of view of a man, and um, uh, one of my earlier novels, the the body of Jonah Boyd, was totally told from a, the point of view of a woman. When I when I the characters in this book, um, you know, I I don't I, I really don't have a lot of trouble um, in my imagination entering into the mind of, any more trouble entering into the mind of a woman than to the mind of a man. Uh, because, you know, to quote my, my, my first writing teacher, Gordon Lish, all our secrets are the same. There's the title of an mm. anthology that he edited. There's a, there's a, mm. or, or as Raymond Carver put it, the time that I met him, the one time that I met him, he said, if you've known one kind of despair, you've known every kind of despair. Well, I think that that means that as a man, yes, you can, you can write from the point of view of a woman. As a woman, yes, you can write from the point of view of a man. Yeah. Um, the the I think the interesting question now that we are starting to see a greater spectrum of gender is 
writing from the point of view of someone who would identify not as a narrative. Mm -hmm. I put my computer into a power cord. I was going to run a battery. That's fine. Mm -hmm. yeah. it, this happened. There, now I'm in the kitchen. <laughs> okay, it worked. Um, yeah, no, I think that that was that. Uh, there are no real young people in the book. No, so there, we don't. We don't have the uh, the uh, you know, the other more um, you know post-binary gender expressions are not represented, which is an interesting. Kind of made it more. Um, I don't know what to say more what, but just you know, it, it was it was that kind of the middle aged version of 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 of, of, of gender, male male femaleness that was that was the one that uh, is the role of the book. But um, yeah, it was interesting. It, it was it, now that I think of it, it was the the world was um, was sort of not broached by by. Um, by youth, it was people of a, you know of a certain stage in life, and that's interesting that they and they because we and people do people in fact in life the you know your friends tend to be your same age you know within ten years of your, yeah. of your age and that's that's just the way life is and and then and, and you know to go outside of that you go you deal with um, you know people's kids and that's and that's a different thing so well, if I. I mean, one of at some point, I, I I'm thinking I may write a, a sort of sequel to this book, uh, yeah. and I was actually planning to, but then COVID happened, and that sort of became such a major issue that I didn't see how I could write continue the story without, uh, in a sense, knowing where COVID was going. But one thing yeah. that I, I I hope to do in the sequel, if I write it, is that there are mm -hmm young people who are mentioned in the book, Aaron, the char characters of Aaron and Rachel have two 18 year old right. twins. Right. I want, their kids bring them, them. Yeah. I want to bring the kids in and I want to bring the yeah. kids in with their ideas about gender that right. are going to irritate their father. And that yeah, yeah. could be a very fun, funny scene to write. Yeah. I mean, the, for sure. I hope you do. You know, uh, I, I have friends, writer friends, who are who are so um, conservative, I guess, in their grammat in their grammar or in their mm -hmm. their ideas about grammar that they simply will not accept the singular they, uh, mm. and it's an interesting clash between yeah. values having to do with gender on the one hand and a kind of a kind of literary puritanism on the other, and mm. I think that that could make a great scene of a of a child. Yeah demanding to be referred to as they yeah with a very resistant parent yeah no you could, you could do a kind of abbott and costello with it yeah like who's on first i think because it was very, it was very very funny but this this brings it back to really the first question you asked which is you know how do i write these scenes well there's a, a the germ of one right there i would start just with that and then see where it went mm -hmm. and maybe i will you know I've, I've, I've got to write something, and it's hard right now. <laughs> we just have one more question. Okay. How did you find yourself balancing righteous emotional responses to Trump's actions with empathy for and analysis of his many supporters? Well, I don't know that the book expresses that much empathy for his many supporters. There's, there's one supporter of Trump who's a character in the book and he himself distant he distances himself from uh was it Hillary Clinton's term um the uh what was it what was it that she called the Trump supporters so famously the the the, 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 the deplorables deplorables right right um and uh but I have to say that's something I've been thinking about a lot um, because I think that one of the, the the challenges of the next few years is that there's got to be more of a conversation. Yeah, thank you, Kenneth. My colleague, my my colleague Kenneth Kidd, just 
put in basket of deplorables. You know, if 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 we're all going to live in this country together, we 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 need to be able to talk to each other. I saw something on on um, MSNBC uh, during the vote counting in Arizona that I was actually really moved by, and I don't know how much I can take from it, but there was a, a reporter going around talking to people um, uh, outside of the the building where the votes were being counted, and there was a a, a woman wearing a t-shirt that said, make America gay again. And mm-hmm. then there was a woman wearing a Trump t-shirt, two young women. The only difference between them being their t-shirts and the fact that the that one was wearing a mask and the other wasn't. And they were having, they were laughing and talking and the reporter came up and I said, and, and said, I'm sorry to interrupt, but this is really interesting. You're on opposite sides, but you're having a conversation. And she said, well, when we started talking to each other, we discovered we had a whole lot in common. Mm-hmm. Okay, now that may be a pipe dream. That may have been just a, a fragment. That may even have been staged, who knows? But I I feel like now that we, we, once Trump is out of the White House, I'm gonna allow myself a glimmer of hope, uh, which is something that I have not allowed myself for four years. And I guess the hope is that those conversations can actually happen. Um, I, the cynic in me thinks they won't, but but there's there's still a hope, not not a huge one, but a small one, and um, you know we'll we'll see. Uh, if I've learned anything over the last few years, it's not to try to predict. It's not it's it's to not try to predict, to to not guess, to not anticipate, because we don't know day to day what's going to happen. Uh, that became maybe we never have, but it's never felt. I've never felt that so acutely as I have as I did during the last four years. Waking up in the morning and thinking, "What's it going to be today?" Um, and maybe there'll be some good news. Well, that is a great note for us to end on. Maybe there will be. <laughs> I feel a lot better than I did when I when I started this conversation because, as I said, I've been watching the news for an hour and a half and I was, you know, close to suicidal. So I'm, I'm glad to have brought it around to a, a positive note. Yes. Well, I hope you all get your copy, Shelter in Place. David and David, thank you both so much for joining us and thanks to our audience and have a great night, everyone. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Totally fun. Thank you.